Hello, my name is Abel Abelson. I am the writer of a few books that might interest you. Links in the description. And today I'd like to talk to all the young neurodivergents out there that have a difficult time. I regularly receive messages from neurodivergent young people, Asperger's, non-neurotypicals of any kind, intellectually gifted people, people who are especially empathetic, and they have a difficult time on this planet that's made by and for, let's call them neurotypicals, which I understand very well because I had a really very difficult time also when I was younger. So in this video, I'd like to address you, young neurodivergent, or you, someone who's interested in how things are for young neurodivergents, because I have my own experience with all that, and I'd like to share it. So if you're young and you're not neurotypical, I think the first thing to be very, very aware of is this simple fact that you're not neurotypical. So some of the young non-neurotypicals are aware of that, but a lot are not. I, for instance, never was aware that I might be not neurotypical, not in a conscious sense. I mean, I felt all the time that I was off compared with the what to me felt like the rest of the world. But at the same time, I didn't feel especially special or better. It was just like things weren't really matching, but I didn't know how or why. And I didn't ascribe it to anything particular in me. So this is the very first thing to be very aware of all the time. If you feel that you're different, I submit that you are different then. There's no reason to feel different in a, in a structural, systematic way, in a way that all day long, all week long, all year long manifests itself and that there wouldn't be some real difference behind it. So yes, you are different. Yes, you are neurodivergent. You're not a neurotypical. And I call it neurodivergence because I am convinced now that for the greatest part, these differences are due to real biological differences in the brain. Now, I know if there are some neurologists out there or students of neurology or whatever, I know that human brains are very much alike. Human brains are even very much similar to mice brains and to monkey brains, etc., etc. That's one way of seeing things, the similarities. At the other end, even within those similarities, there are differences. And these differences really have a significant effect on how you feel throughout the day, how you interact with things, with people, how you think, how you process data, how you communicate, etc. Although these differences, biologically speaking, may be quite small, they're significant enough to really change significantly who you are and how you feel in the world. And I'm not only talking about differences in size of parts or size of the brain, of course. There's a lot going on with the relative quantity of different types of cells in the brain, of how they are connected, of hormonal production, of susceptibility to hormones, etc., etc. So this is the first thing. Yes, you're different. And yes, there's a good biological reason for this. You're not just acting up. You're not just being difficult. It's none of those things. None of those things that parents tend to think because it's probably the easiest thing to think for them or because they just don't think further or whatever. It's not like that. You are really different. And the difference is for a good part biological. And I stress this point because it's not by going to a psychologist or by therapy that you're going to become normal. Which brings me to the second point. You're perfectly fine as you are. You're perfect the way you are. Everyone, everything is perfect the way it is. It's just like ants are perfect the way they are. It's not like they should have eight legs or two legs. They have six legs and they're perfectly perfect with this. An elephant shouldn't be smaller. A giraffe shouldn't have a shorter neck. 
And the same goes for all the differences in humans. Someone who has lower IQ scores shouldn't have higher IQ scores. It's not like if it's a fault. If It's not like if it's something that should be remedied. Someone who thinks a lot shouldn't per se think less. Who's really very empathetic shouldn't become less empathetic and vice versa. The way I see it, someone who is not empathetic at all shouldn't become empathetic. It's like uh, snakes and lizards. They're not really empathetic as far as I know, but it's not necessary that they become empathetic. What is necessary is that, is that we know that they're not empathetic and that we take it into account and we accept it. And starting from there, we can arrange things so they go perfectly well for everybody. So, point one, know that you're different. Point two, know that you're perfect the way you are. And that's unconditional. It's not like you're perfect the way you are, if only... Blah, blah, blah. No, you are perfect the way you are. Point. Now, third point, you have certain characteristics. Everybody has certain characteristics. And there is no such thing as the template of the human being with its set of human characteristics. And whatever diverges of these characteristics is like not okay. It's not like that. There are only differences. There is no superior. There is no inferior. There are only differences. And this is the point where first you have to accept your characteristics. I'm even jumping over a step. Actually, the first step, which is even more important, is knowing your characteristics. Now, this may sound easy, but it's really very difficult to get to know yourself exactly as you are. Because the moment you look at yourself exactly the way you are, some stuff kicks in. What kicks in is, for instance, the expectations of the people around you. They will expect you to be whatever. Smart, nice, all kinds of stuff. You're not necessarily what they expect you to be. And maybe you will have difficulty accepting that. The same way they have difficulty accepting that. And this might lead you to actually skew your observation. Where you might say, well, actually, I'm not all that intelligent or empathetic or whatever. Or, actually, I'm quite intelligent and empathetic, etc. Which could be more based on expectations and wishful thinking or inversely a habit of looking at yourself worse than you really are. Both will lead you to not see yourself exactly as you are. And there's the first problem. If you don't see yourself exactly as you are, there's no way you're going to be able to find your place in life. It's impossible. In the same way, it's very necessary to observe everybody around you and in the wider world and to accept their characteristics exactly as they are. Now, maybe you could wish for people to be smarter in general. Well, they're not. Maybe you could wish for people to be more empathetic in general. Well, they're not. They are as they are. Some of them are very empathetic. Some of them are psychopathic. Some of them are smart. Some of them are not. Some of them are smart in one aspect and not at all in others. Some are smart but not wise. Some are wise but not very smart. You have the whole zoo around you. And it's very, very necessary that you observe people exactly as they are and accept their characteristics exactly as they are. And this goes for people far away in other countries. This goes for your co-citizens. This goes for your father, your mother, your brother, your sister. This goes for everyone. And for all of those, each in their way, it is difficult to accept their characteristics. It's difficult to accept that there is this violent tendency among lots of people. It's difficult to accept that your parents have certain characteristics that really make your life miserable. You might be tempted, you are tempted, everybody is, me too, 
to brush it under the carpet, the things you find annoying, repulsive, problematic, that scare you, that depress you. There is a part of your brain, of your mind, that occupies itself with trying to brush these things under the carpet. Again, this is a characteristic. There's nothing wrong with this part of your mind. At times it's necessary because you can't handle it all and maybe you have to brush it under the carpet and then bit by bit get it from under the carpet and look at it when you can, when you have the stomach for it and the energy for it. But if you simply let this part of your mind always brush stuff under the carpet, you are not rid of your stuff, it's under your carpet and it will make your life very difficult. So the next step is once you get to know these characteristics of yourself and of other people, you will be very tempted to try to change them. It's normal, it's healthy, it's a good reaction. However, you should be aware that people don't change a lot and that you're not the only person that's going to want to change them. Every person is subject to a gigantic ocean of influences in which you are just one small element. So you may think that you will have a lot of influence on a person. This person is under the influence also of other people in their surroundings, of their parents, maybe even deceased, of what the organizations they exist in expect from them, etc., etc. So thinking that you can change people significantly is actually not very realistic. It's not a problem that you can't change them. The problem is when you think you can change them more than you can. So my advice here is, apart from never accept advice from anyone, if you want to try to change people, do so by all means, but calculate that you probably won't succeed. So the wiser thing to do is acceptance. Acceptance doesn't mean just lie down and kind of die. That's not acceptance. Acceptance means I observe stuff, I respect my observation as it is without letting hope and wishful thinking and uh, all these kinds of things interfere with my observation. I accept it, I respect it, and I go from there. That's acceptance. Acceptance can lead to a lot of action. Acceptance can lead to violent action if necessary. And by violence, I don't mean aggression. I don't mean going out and aggressing people. Violence can be self-defense. And it may be necessary. Based on your accepting of what you see, of what you perceive. That's acceptance. Acceptance doesn't necessarily have to be showing the other cheek if someone slaps you on the cheek. It can very well be defending yourself with all means necessary, accepting the observation that this person or entity in front of you will kill you if you don't. And once you're at this point, then you're ready to puzzle it all together. And only then. If you're going to puzzle together your hopes of what people should be, but what they're not, and your ideas about yourself that are mistaken, and other faulty observations and false hopes and wishful thinking. If you're going to puzzle those together, the result will just be something that doesn't correspond to reality. It may look like a nice puzzle to you, it will be useless. And if you're, the, the puzzle you make of reality, if your model of reality and of yourself is faulty, that's when you're bound to be unhappy. Because you hit the wall of reality over and over again. If I think that in front of me there's not a wall while there is one, I will run straight ahead, but the wall is there and I will run into it. It's important to see the wall for what it is in order for me to be able to, happy, to be happy. And so the puzzling together of all these characteristics, that's the basic stuff of happiness. And yes, this universe isn't perfect. It's not as if everybody will love you. There's no way everybody will love you, whatever or however you are. If you're very peaceful and nice, there are still a lot of people that will hate you for it. If you're violent and aggressive, there will be a lot of people that will appreciate this because they like 
like warrior like aggressive people and a lot of other people will hate you if you're smart some people will like you and others will hate you for it there's no way you will be loved by everyone ever so that's another like rosy dream that's actually making life into a nightmare don't try to have everyone appreciate or love you you will have to choose who you want to love you and appreciate you and just let others not love you and not appreciate you the world is big they can go elsewhere they're not obliged to have relationships with you they can ignore you they can they can put their attention in other things that they do like so it's not your fault that if you're not the way they would want you to be that they are unhappy they can just occupy themselves with anything else and leave you be and they won't be unhappy so if they're unhappy with how you are it's actually their fault that they keep on pointing their attention to you now if your parents don't like this well they don't i know this makes life very difficult especially while you have to live together with them but even decades later if your parents don't like who you are it's still somehow a bit difficult but at the same time especially when you're an adult you really don't need them you don't even need them to love you they can hate you it's okay whatever they're just a few adults uh, a few blocks or kilometers or thousands of kilometers away and they don't like you well shit happens man they can op- occupy themselves with something else or they can try in their own way starting to accept you maybe but don't expect it from them let them be if you're very empathetic it's a characteristic that you'll have to incorporate in the puzzle of your happy life people always see high empathy as a boon as an advantage as something great actually when you have high empathy it's not all that great at all because there's a lot of shit going on and it all affects you so actually if you're very empathetic you will have to protect yourself you will have to portion the amount of emotional contact you have with the world otherwise you'll simply be exhausted and swept away by it if you're very smart it makes certain things easy it makes other things difficult it's really lonely being very smart imagine if you have a normal iq of around 100 and you would be around mentally retarded people as they call them of about an iq of 70 you would in a certain sense be a bit lonely yes they can be very nice people etc but there's a level of contact that you can't have with them the same goes for very smart people compared to normal people so every characteristic has its definite advantages and its definite challenges every single characteristic has this in you and in others and this is the puzzle to put together dynamically on a daily basis day by day hour by hour second by second puzzling together these characteristics in the best way possible and then there remains the final acceptance of the fact that this universe if you want has certain characteristics this is a universe where you can't be at two places at the same time it's a universe where you can't just like go back in time and repair something it's a universe where all these things are realities and so it's again unrealistic and a sure way to unhappiness if you're going to want things that this universe simply does not provide in its core characteristics there's another part of acceptance to do so i have a few decades of personal experience in trying all this and fighting with it and and succeeding in stuff and not succeeding in stuff and observing a lot of things in me and in other people and this is why i wrote my book how to handle neurotypicals everything i said before actually comes in one form or another back in this book and there's more like about self projecting as a basic source of great unhappiness especially for neurodivergent people So if you're interested in all that you really should check out this book the link is in the description thank you for your comments for liking and sharing and for those who buy my books you're all just 
fabulous people. Be happy, be yourself, and see you in the next video.